for the regular meeting of the Amherst Board of Education Board, please. Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And we'll call, please. Mr. Yakubozzi? Here. Mr. Zappa? Here. Mr. Engel? Here. Mrs. Gillis? Here. Mrs. Snyder? Here. I'd like to obtain a motion to adopt the agenda and any all that didn't observe you. So moved. Second. Discussion? Roll call. Mr. Engel? Aye. Mrs. Gillis? Aye. Mrs. Snyder? Aye. Mr. Zappa? Aye. Mr. Yakubozzi? Aye. Did anyone sign the, uh, the sheet when I just read it? No. Okay. All right. Uh, let's move on to the treasurer's report. Amy? Uh, two things that I would like to bring to the board this evening. Um, one, the Finance Audit Committee met last Thursday, May 20th, uh, 7.30 in the morning to review two things, the Fiscal 20 Financial Audit and the five-year forecast. <clears throat> all in all, the Fiscal 20 Audit was, you know, really, really good. There were a couple of verbal comments. Um, we have strong internal controls in the district, and I thank everybody for, uh, for playing along well. We, we did well again. Uh, the second thing I would like to do with the board this evening is the five-year forecast. It's May. So, um, you want to proceed, Mike? We're going to go through this pretty quickly. We're not going to cover the content on all of the slides. As you know, you've been through this all, you're all returning board members many times. The basis for the report is the requirement of the Ohio Rights Code. It's submitted to the Ohio Department of Education. It's a semi annual requirement. It includes this year, in the past, it was just the general fund, one of the recommendations. Uh, strong recommendations by the Auditor of State for the Fiscal 20 audit is that we carve out the, the revenue and expenditures for the emergency levy um, separate and apart from the general fund. Both of them are operational, but by Ohio Revised Code, Fund 16, the emergency levy revenues are required to be broken out. So this year I've made a notation at the top of the forecast that it's both general fund 001 and fund 016. It includes three prior years. Uh, the current year is for future consecutive years, same way with expenditures. The assumptions are um, a rather large um, document with many exhibits explaining the mechanics of the forecast. <coughs> um, roadmap to the district's financial future, just as it is with any district. It, it, Amherst is no different. This is a requirement, but there's a useful purpose for it, for planning, planning for consistency, planning for change. And it allows the district to research and, and um, anticipate revenues and projected expenditures with particular assumptions. And that's why the assumption document is required to be submitted along with the forecast. Go ahead, Mike. Obstacles. Expenditures often outpace revenue. Every, every district, every public entity, you're, you're going to hear this. Um, the uncertainty. Our uncertainty lies in changes and additions in federal awards. We have some um, relatively material sums in federal awards. Um, for the most part, have not been included in the mechanics of this forecast because we have not yet begun to spend ESSER two, and we've not even finally been approved for ESSER three. So all those expenditures for ESSER three will come in fiscal 22 next year and subsequent years. And then we have changes in income stream, um, revenue, current, uh, excuse me, uh, local revenues and state foundation revenues. And what affects that is changes in legislation. In every budget, in every five year forecast in the school district, we're working with multiple biennial budgets in the state. So we are pretty much at the, at the mercy of the state for levels in uh, state funding. Go ahead, Mike. <coughs> This is just a graphic. I'm not going to go through all of it. It's rather busy putting the two side by side. But what it's meant to show is that we're consistent in our last year. In November, you saw fiscal 20, uh, which was the last year's expenditures, excuse me, revenue, compared to the final year of this forecast, fiscal 25. The, the areas are all very, very similar. Um, go ahead, Mike. So our projected revenue, this just shows again for fiscal 21, um, 
point, 43.78% of our revenue is generated locally in line 101 and uh, 102 is public utility personal property. Together they make up uh, uh, almost half of our revenue stream. The big gray area is the unrestricted, that's our foundation, and it's almost 30, 38.5% of our revenue budget. Go ahead, Mike. Um, this shows our line 101, it's the top line in the forecast, it shows our real estate revenue. This is real estate revenue for residential and uh, commercial and industrial. Um, in the, the latter three lines, which are fiscal 23, 24, and 25, you see it dip down. Those amounts are representative, the blue as it's seen, are our continuing levies. The parts that it doesn't show must be renewed, and those are reflected on the lower section of the forecast. Go ahead, Mike. Cuts in revenue from the state. Last year we received a $730,000 um, revenue cut. Um, we were expecting um, the same or greater in this year, and it's not happened. Um, it's more along the lines of $250,000 to $260,000. Of course, we still have um, two, two uh, foundation settlements to receive from the state, but we are showing about um, a cut of $255,000 to $260,000 for the year. And then next year, fiscal 22 starts a new binding budget. Um, as far as revenues, I have a note there on the bottom, fiscal 23 to 25, revenues from the state are held steady. We, we know nothing else, so we're just going to hold them steady. Go ahead, Mike. This shows um, the three years in red are um, fiscal 18, 19, and 20. And the years in blue are the years of our forecast, the current year, fiscal 21, 22, 23, through 25. Obviously, they're showing very little. Go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. This just shows expenditures. And again, what you see is consistency from planning purposes. Our expenditures are very similar five years from now as what they are right now. Go ahead, Mike. Major expenditures in the forecast, nearly 58% are salaries and wages. Fringe benefits, 20 and a half, 20.6. Purchase services, over 14. That is nearly 93% of the expenditures for the district. Um, I would say that this is in line with a lot of districts, but keep in mind that a lot of districts, the salaries and, and fringe benefits, exceed well above 80% of the budget. That's something that is controlled very well here in Amherst. Go ahead, Mike. Another illustration of salaries and fringes. Um, the six bars on the left are actual years. The forecasted years are the ones on the right, 21 through 25. Again, they increase, but they, they don't increase at a rate um, where they do in a lot of districts. Go ahead. Trend is revenue expenditures and cash balance. This is always a very telling graph. Um, total revenues are in blue, total expenditures are in orange, and the yellow is the cash balance line. Um, now this looks a bit different than it did in November. We have more cash on hand at the end of the five-year forecast than what we did in the November budget. A lot has played into, um, into that um, greater local revenue than what we thought, greater um, state revenue than what we thought, greater um, miscellaneous revenue than what we thought. Um, we received $595,000 this year in BWC rebates. And you would never forecast that, right? <laughs> you would never forecast that. So those have big impacts on, on, the, um, on the, the budget. And um, so the trend is um, typically, typically what you see our expenditures outpacing revenues, but this budget is definitely better news than what the November budget was. Go ahead, Mike. Consistency. Really important that we feel that we're consistent. Prudent financial practices, and we've built um, over the last 10 to 15 years a much healthier financial position than, than previously. Go ahead. Our look to the future. Um, we are, we are, we feel blessed. We feel lucky that we're able to say that 
um, we're able to be financially stable um, through the end of the forecast. A lot of districts cannot say that. The caveat there is, the premise is that the renewal levies, those are included in all of our calculations as though we passed them. So it is it's very important that the renewal levies um, um, pass. Go ahead, Mike. Um, our focus and our goal, um, as we carefully and thoughtfully consider district expenditure, we want to make sure that they have little if no impact to the high quality educational programs offered here in Amherst. And what is, we talked about this at State of the Schools, a couple of the board members were present. Um, while Amherst consistently performs in the top 20% of the state of all of the districts, more than 600 districts, we consistently have expenditures per pupil in the lowest 20%. Um, and that's why Right there is why our forecast is favorable at the end of a five-year period. Go ahead, Mike. Here's our mission. Go ahead. Everybody that plays a role in, in um, producing this forecast, um, this year, this spring, um, Mr. Sayers and I spent quite a bit of time with Mr. Molnar uh, working on the forecast and um, just mulling it over and going through some calculations um, is a way to mentor him in developing um, financial abilities, um, such as the, the current superintendent, Mr. Sayers. Um, but thank you for the board. Thank you to the audit committee um, and everybody else who played a hand in this. Um, does anybody have any questions? Um, you see a fabulous, might I say, <laughs> packet in front of you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> cover page and, and table of contents, a letter of transmittal, the eight pages of assumptions. If you read anything, I would rather you read the eight pages of assumptions and then read through the exhibits. Um, the first three pages of the exhibits are the forecast. Um, there's one in traditional portrait, very difficult to read, very small. And then the next two pages are in landscape format over the over two pages, much easier to read and understand. Does anybody have any questions? Did I go through that too quickly? You want me to cover more detail? No. <laughs> I just wanted to follow up if it's okay and just uh, thank Amy uh, for her work and developing the forecast. As you can tell, there's a lot of work uh, that goes into preparing this forecast, and this doesn't just happen overnight. Uh, it's a fairly uh, lengthy process. That so again, thank you to Amy for her work with that. And obviously for us, a key message that we're going to begin to communicate uh, you know, to our community uh, financially is that uh, you know, we have these two renewal levies that will be coming up within the next uh, year or so. And uh, the good news is if we can pass those renewal levies, which of course are no tax increase, just uh, continuing to receive what we're currently receiving, but if we can pass those, uh, to be able to say that we will be financially stable through at least, we would say at least 2025, because it, as of right now, it's the end of the forecast. So uh, that's a good, good position to be in. And uh, so you'll start to see us communicate and get that message out uh, to our community. So all in all, we're very, very fortunate, very blessed uh, with the with the position we're in. And again, you know, thank you, uh, Amy, uh, for your work. And, I know Rex and Ron, your guidance uh, with the finance uh, finance committee, much appreciated. So thank you. Anybody have any questions? I mean, the five-year forecast is, a, is an incredible. It, it's a great management tool. I mean, it really helps the district understand where we were, where we are, where we're going, and we try to figure out okay, how we're how we're going to get from point A to point B. But if you if we Using that is probably the most important thing we have as far as the, the management tool of the district and how we operate. Um, and, and it's not easy to put together. It's very time consuming. And whatever Amy thought in terms of assumptions yesterday, I can guarantee you it's already changed today. It changes every single day. It's a working tool. So thank you again. If not, no questions. We'll move on to the treasurer's recommendations. Okay. So tonight I have some of the basic recommendations. We have the approval of the minutes from the April 26th meeting, 
we have treasurer's reports from April of 2021. Uh, we have the five-year forecast for your approval this evening. Item D, uh, something that you typically see, which basically are appropriations changes. Um, we have Fund 19, we're creating an E-rate account, um, and that represents the different technology type expenditures that are federally reimbursed at a, typically a 50% rate, right, Mr. Sayers? But not everything is eligible. This happens to have been a pricey project, this $56,000 that we received nearly 50% reimbursement from, from the um, federal government on. Fund 467 is the student wellness. We're increasing that to the amount of um, the cash at fiscal year end last year plus what we received this year. If you recall, back in the fall, we had been told that we were going to receive uh, about $105,000 cut in the Fund 467, which was the Student Wellness and Supports Grant. Ended up, they restored all but about $25,000 of that, so we had to increase the appropriation. And then Fund uh, 401 is the auxiliary services, non-public monies that go to St. Joe's. Um, we're increasing that for the amount of actual revenue received this year, plus um, investment revenue. Item E is um, required uh, for the 2016 bond issue for the Classroom Facilities Assistance Program, which was the co-funded project that built um, the new Powers Elementary. Um, and that is a half of a mill equivalent. Item F, we have medical and dental rates for your approval this evening. Item G, our TPA, our third party administrator um, agreement is due for renewal. The renewal date's actually September 1st, but they have to send the document to us months early so we can bring it to the board for approval early. And then item H, uh, we have donations. Any questions? No questions, and I'll entertain a motion to approve treasurer's recommendation to so item 7A through H. I'll move. Second. Tracy made the motion right second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Gellis? Aye. Mr. Engel? Aye. Mrs. Snyder? Aye. Mr. Zappa? Aye. Mr. Yakubozzi? Aye. <clears throat> Steve? Thank you very much, Mr. Yakubozzi. Just uh, I had a, a couple of items here before I turn it over to uh, Mr. Molmar, uh, I did want to recognize and draw attention to our retiring staff issue uh, probably remember from last year we kind of changed the way we, we recognized our retirees and Amanda Sears has been very very helpful and she developed a, a nice video it's a four or five minute video to recognize all of our retiring staff and uh, we actually emailed that out uh, to our entire staff this afternoon and I believe it's also been posted on the website and Facebook as well so again, just wanted to, to say thank you to our retiring staff for their service and dedication and obviously going to miss their, uh, their impact uh, on our students and our community.
As you can tell, Amanda has quite a talent for developing videos like that. Just a, I think a neat, neat way to recognize our retirees. And like I said, that's been emailed out. It's posted, I think, on Facebook. Uh, yeah, posted this afternoon. We'll have it on our website. If it's not already up there, we'll have it on the website tomorrow. So hopefully uh, that video will get a lot of views uh, throughout the community. The other thing I had, uh, just to, and I know we've talked about this before, but and it seems appropriate to mention it again, that uh, you know, we've got three days of school left. And just wanted to, uh, again, acknowledge and thank our, our students, our staff, and our community for just an incredible, incredible job this school year. Uh, we were talking at the county superintendent's meeting a couple of weeks ago, and the question that was posed to all of us was, you know, what's the one thing that we're most proud of? And for me, that was, uh, that was an easy question to answer. Uh, as I think back, uh, the fact that we have been in school five days a week since August the 27th with no pandemic uh, shutdowns is uh, just something, it's just, it, to me it's amazing that we've been able to make that happen and as a credit, you know, as I say, to our students, to our staff, and, and to our families, and 75 to 80 percent of our students have been taking advantage of that option. And at the same time, uh, we felt that providing a choice uh, to those families that weren't comfortable sending their children to school was very, very important. And we were able to do that and provide a very high quality e-campus program. And uh, it's it just, it, it's amazing when you reflect back on where we were in August and where we are now. And I had a teacher actually uh, tell me today, she said, you know, Steve, it's been by far and away the most challenging year of my career, but at the same time, it was the most rewarding year of my career. And she said, I just feel like I'm a better teacher as a result of having gone through this experience. And I think we're, as we talked to the state of the schools, I think we're a better school district than we were a year ago because of the adjustments, the, um, the way we had to adapt, the creativity that we were kind of forced into. Uh, it's just been neat. And uh, again, wanted to share that with the board. What an incredible job our students and our staff uh, have done this year. So that completes my report. Yeah, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Moore. Is there another video that was put out to the entire staff on an appreciation video? Not yet. That's still that's yeah. That's, that's still in, <laughs> that's still in the works. It's <laughs> still in the works. Is Steve Rigo taking my graduation? Yeah, I can, you know that that ties into you know just our staff and our students doing a, doing a great job. I mean, that commencement was was another step you know along that road, and uh, it just went very very well. Uh, I spent some time after the ceremony in that Gateway Plaza, I think they call it, between the arena and also uh, Progressive Field, and just uh, heard from many of our graduating seniors and families. Um, just how much they enjoyed it and the folks at Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse were just great uh, and again to be the first school to graduate from Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse it, it's just an amazing thing so again just to wrote our staff I mean so well organized um, just all the work that that went in ahead of time you show up that day and again you things that have to happen that day but so many things that went into getting ready uh, for Saturday and that ceremony, and it was just, I, I think, a neat experience for our kids and their, their families and our staff as well. So, again, thank you to the, to the board for your support and you know, just allowing us to do what it is we do, and um, it's just a lot of fun when you can watch it all come together. Thank you. Thank you. All right, as Steve mentioned, COVID changed a lot of things this year, uh, so I just want to highlight a few things as we move forward in the future. Um, one is I, I passed out to everyone uh, a virtual field trip list. This was put together by Amanda Sears, who did the video. Uh, just that some of the virtual field trips our students took, since they could not participate in extracurricular or real field trips outside of the school district. For those in the audience who don't have it in front of you, I mean, there are some fun places that students visited. <coughs> One butterfly in California, salt marshes in California, elephant sanctuaries in Tennessee. So I thought this was a cool list that Amanda put together. Uh, about 15 different places, so kudos to her and Beth Schwartz and also all the teachers who participated with this. Um, the students logged 23,000 miles, virtual miles, visiting uh, these, these different places, so I thought that was really cool. 
Um, another thing I wanted to mention was, as you know, something else COVID cool changed this year was how we kind of deliver some of our special events. And so Doug Cogdell and his tech team came up with a new concept called Commons Live, which we've been using to promote and show live events, um, sports, graduation commencement just on Saturday was through Commons Live. Um, and you know, one of the one of the things he wants to do is kind of create a team of students to kind of work with Commons Live, participate with it. I guess eventually kind of help them prepare for uh, Steel News Live in the future. And so I just want to highlight this. He had a, he had a meeting a few weeks ago for students and parents to attend to want to be, maybe participate in the program. And he had 120 kids show up for the meeting. Half of them applied, and um, 25 were selected. I think uh, about five were from Steel and 20 from AJH. Uh, and and, and the, those who weren't selected are still part of the team. You know, they, they're like alternates that will come and go as needed with all the different plot events. So <laughs> if you look to next year, this Comments Slack should really be a, a great program that continues to take more steps and leaps and bounds. And I, I'm really excited about what, what he's doing. Also, real quick from commencement, while Doug was in the booth at Rocket Morgan's Fieldhouse, uh, one of the lead Technicians, one of the lead people in the booth, their, their spouse graduated from Steel. And so he made a connection there, and uh, Doug and the, and, the, and the Comets Live team will be invited back next year uh, during, I think, a Monsters game to be in the booth and kind of see how things are run in real life. I thought that was a real cool connection that was made. So kudos to Doug and his team. Uh, I wanted to make uh, mention that we are preparing a summer experience program. And one of the things that we at the house have to do is prepare for uh, possible instructional losses here because of COVID, we had to prepare a summer uh, program. And so all schools have shifted. So we're preparing one. That will go out this week for parents to actually sign up officially. We did send out a, a kind of a preview for those to see how many are interested in the program. And again, as Steve mentioned, our, our staff and teachers, everyone did such a phenomenal job this year. Um, you know, all school districts are expecting some sort of instructional loss, but I don't think we're really expecting as much as others. I think there's going to be some, but I think it's going to be very little because, again, the, the tremendous e-campus program that teachers put together, all the work our on-campus teachers did to kind of keep things as normal as possible. Um, and so to kind of mirror that, we only had, we had under 5% of our parents who were interested in the summer program. Because, again, I think it's because they, they think we had an excellent school year, their students learned a tremendous amount, and so uh, we have some interested, but not as, as many of you other schools. So I just want the public know that that's going to be coming out this week for, for kids to sign up. And it's open to everyone. So hope that happens. And my final, uh, final comment is uh, I invited, we have three staff members who are on the board agenda this evening to transfer into brand new positions in Amherst. Uh, this year, we, going into next year, created uh, new positions, uh, instructional coach positions. So, like Amanda Sears is our technology innovation specialist. She's a teacher who's there to help other teachers, right? Just become better and do better and give them support. Um, and so we've created new positions in literacy and math. And we have those three teachers who all came tonight. I wanted to kind of present them and show you them. Uh, Maureen Wolf, just, just go ahead and stand for a moment. <laughs> uh, she's going to be our new math instructional coach. We were planning on hiring one literacy coach, but uh, we had two phenomenal candidates. And uncharacteristically of Steve, I said, you know, it wouldn't be great if we had both of them. And he, and he said, go for it. We'll figure out funding later. So I said, okay. So uh, Brianna Cardin is our new literacy coach. And also Eric Coffin, please stand as our literacy coach as well. And again, if you, if you talk to teachers, you know, they, they put so much time and effort in everything they do, right? Every minute detail they want to be perfect and they put so much work in. If you ask the teacher what can we do, they're always going to say, I just need more time and I need some more support. But I'll handle the rest, right? And so that's the goal of really these coaches. Um, we sometimes can't give teachers more time, but we can give them the support and through that possibly they can hand off some things to our coaches who can take some things off their plate and then maybe give it back to them and that saves them some time. But we're really excited because what we've seen Amanda Sears do with technology, and I've said this before, we could have placed her in a classroom and had her work with kids as a technology special throughout the day. And that would make an impact. 
but her impact on working with teachers, helping teachers better in the classroom, is just we get so much more out of it. So that's the goal of the role of these coaches. If they're there to collaborate, support, lead, teach, and, and just help. And, and all of them, I mean, that's who they are, I'll, I'll speak. That's one of the reasons I, I, I select, we selected them is because as people, um, they're just wonderful people who just want to serve and help others. And I have to say one more thing. Um, we posted it internally and externally. You know, we're always looking for the best. And a lot of districts and educational service centers are hiring coaches right now because it's a big thing. It's needed because of the instructional loss of COVID. And uh, they're having a tough time finding people. So when I interviewed, I, I interviewed external coaches. I interviewed coaches that are working with companies in math and literacy. And the best we had was in house. Not only did we hire three internal people, but the finalists were all internal. Because the best people I had to interview were all internal, already in here in Amherst. So I'm looking forward to it. Who knows, one day we'll have 20 coaches. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm just excited to get started with these three and, and, and pair them. I know, it's not for them. <laughs> <laughs> but pair these three with also already Amanda Sears and Beth Schwartz as technology instructional coaches, this team of five is going to be great. So I'm excited. and. Congratulations and thank you for being here tonight. Congratulations. <laughs> ceremony was uh, well attended. It was outside at Black River on Friday, which is a whole new location for them. They asked the end about 4,500 people there. So I don't know whether that's a factual number or not, but for the first time in history, there was no limitation of the number of people who could attend. Because typically those students had been only two tickets because it's always been held in the house. And last year it was not that So I would be willing to say that their new home Time this entire school year had its first in person meeting uh, last Thursday. So it was, um, it was kind of like, you know, there was a board member that we had never physically met because they came on the board in January as a replacement board for our school district. So we've only ever heard uh, because we never did one of those meetings. We were never Zoom, we were just conversation. Oh, yeah, they, we never saw each other uh, virtually. So um, I just want to say that it's been a great year at the JBS. Um, there's will be some new changes. And some of the well-known people will be fired. I haven't read that. I should have to get you on. So you know, we call the new person in charge. A couple of those high visible disciplines that the JBS is known for. So we have some new people next year. But uh, the program will excel and get better, I'm sure, with that. So, uh, on behalf of the JBS, we just thank Amherst for all of the support that they have provided and give to the JBS throughout the year. Because you can see your students um, have done very well this year. I thought it was interesting that a report that we got last Thursday was that the um, Overland School District is in the process of building a new school. So, we had to hear uh, how innovative they were in having students come to do some electrical work and some work on their new building. Well, I could not sit there <laughs> and say, well, it's really not that new and innovative because they were upset that they couldn't have masonry trades and some of those trades help because they had to go through a whole lot more process and they thought they had to be like, you know, uh, 
the Amherst School District has done those programs with their dugouts and lots of things, and they just kind of said, oh, you've already done something. And I said, oh, yeah, we had made masonry, we had electricity, we had all, a lot of those. So I think that, it, and then, of course, Spiral's is in the process of building. I said, we didn't have to do anything with the new building that we built, but I said, we've always had to do small projects where they were actually mostly in control and did the whole project. So um, that was enlightening to some of those school districts that we need to do that. So, Again, I think that we have always been cutting edge in some of the things that we do with the JBS and with the Amherst, as well as I think with the Amherst schools, I would certainly thank you that I think you're the only school district in the Lane County this year that didn't have some kind of COVID shutdown or have to take a break. And I commend you for the effort that you put forth because I know the JBS was closed for about six weeks in there because of COVID. So I want to just personally thank you for the support that you have given not only the JBS but the entire Amherst community in making the, the five-day in-person work as well as the virtual go a long way because there's not another school district that can tout that in the Rain County. Probably you're probably in a handful of those that could do that in the whole state of Ohio. So I congratulate you all um, I congratulate you for the efforts that you put forth and for the demands, and I know that they were hard demands, but the demands that you put on the faculty and staff to accomplish those things because they, they did ups, turn their world upside down. And I've spoken to a couple of other school districts that had to do it simultaneously, where they were teaching an in-person class and doing a virtual class at the same time. And those educators are ready to be done in education because they said there was just no way that we could engage both sets of people at the same time because you're trying to you know, do one thing with virtual people and then they're not listening and then you're trying to do it at the same time with the classroom. So congratulations on a fantastic year in the Amherst School Thank you. Thank you. Okay, want to go to the personnel recommendations, please? Sure. Okay, on to uh, personnel. Uh, as the board can see, uh, and as you're aware from previous years, I, this is a very, very busy month in terms of uh, personnel items. Uh, again, I know you've had an opportunity to review and look through and uh, ask questions regarding the agenda. I did want to highlight one item, that item L, in personnel, and I believe this has been changed in Evernote, but uh, on the attachment, uh, which is 10E, I think it is, I don't, yes, 10E, and it references uh, supplemental contracts for summer transportation trips. Compensation is set at step 10 and not at step five. The original document had step five but that was actually changed, so that should read as step 10. So again, I think you may already have that in your Evernote, but I wanted to highlight that change. And I think that's it for personnel. would like to, at this time, recommend items 10A through 10X. So moved. Second. Discussion? Roll call, please. Mr. Engel? Aye. Mrs. Snyder? Aye. Mrs. Gillis? Aye. Mr. Zappa? Aye. Mr. Yacoposi? Aye. Educational recommendations? Uh, thank you, Mr. Yacoposi. Again, uh, items that typically you see this time of year, I uh, wanted to highlight item A, where you see updated school calendar. As you're aware, we previously approved the school calendar, but this is simply an update, which includes the parent-teacher conference dates, as well as the open house dates uh, for next year as well. With that, we'd like to recommend approval of items 11A through 11I. <laughs> Discussion? We'll call. Mr. Zappa? Aye. Mrs. Gillis? Aye. Mr. Engel? Aye. Mrs. Snyder? Aye. Mr. Yacoposi? Aye. Just recommendations? Just one item. Again, this is facility agreement for the hosting of our track and field the tournaments, the many uh, that we host here, uh, SWC tournament, district tournament, regional tournament, and uh, again, this is that uh, site agreement with OHSAA. 
recommend approval of item 12A. So moved. Second. Discussion? Roll call. Mr. Engel? Aye. Mrs. Gillis? Aye. Mrs. Snyder? Aye. Mr. Zappa? Aye. Mr. Zappacosi? Aye. Uh, I'd like to entertain a motion to move to the next session uh, for the purpose of discussing employment. Uh, no action to be taken afterwards. So moved. Second. Roll call. Mrs. Snyder? Aye. Mrs. Gillis? Aye. Mr. Engel? Aye. Mr. Zappa? Aye. Mr. Akhilosi? Aye. Again, thank you everyone for helping me, uh, helping to make it such a, such a rewarding school year. Appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>